Welcome. Welcome to this edition of the AI at Wharton and Analytics at Wharton podcast series on artificial intelligence. Today's episode will actually have a dual role. While it says AI in education here, our guest actually has lots of expertise in AI in education and the workforce and a lot more general topics as well. I'm joined by my faculty colleague, uh, Ethan Mollick. Ethan is the Ralph J. Roberts Distinguished Faculty Scholar. He's an associate professor in our management department. He's also the academic director of Wharton Interactive. So, Ethan, welcome to our podcast series. I'm thrilled to be here. Thank you. Well, I don't even know where to start because... I'll just say, and and this is my first question to you, most of what I've learned on AI and education, we'll start there, is by watching the five-part series that you and your wife created. Um, So could you tell our listeners here on our AI and education and workforce uh, episode, what was in those five episodes? Like, what do all of us as professors need to know about AI and education? Well, I mean, there's at least three different things that matter, right? The first thing that matters is disruption. Uh, homework is over, right? There's not a homework assignment basically anywhere that a well-prompted AI can't solve at this point. So that's a big deal. And just to be clear, let me take them one at a time. There are, explain to our listeners, there are multiple versions of even, let's even say ChatGPT, which is just one of the open AI sources. Like some versions can ingest documents, some versions cannot, some have just a text prompt. So which version or versions are you referring to when you say kind of, Home, homework as we know it is over. Okay, so when you think about AI, you want to think about um, sort of all of the what's called foundation models, which are Llama and ChatGPT, all these kind of different models. But you also want to think about what are called frontier models, not to create more confusing vocabulary. But there's really only three frontier models right now, which are OpenAI's ChatGPT4, yep. uh, which is the paid version, but you can also get it for free through Microsoft Bing in creative mode, which turns out to be really important for education for reasons we'll talk about. Which is the way I do right now. Right. And it, it's a little limited in some ways. It's, it's weird. It uh, has a personality. We can talk about that. Then there is um, Google's Bard, which right now is powered by an underpowered model called Palm 2. But all the rumors are that it will be upgraded to a model that probably will be the first model to beat GPT-4 in the next couple of months. And then finally, there's a company called Anthropic that has a product called Claude 2. So when we talk, when I talk about AI can do something, I'm almost always talking about the frontier models. So GPT-4 um, currently has like a separate mode for vision and pictures. That's all being united. There's already been, ah, they're already okay. rolling that out. So it'll be able to take in documents, take in images, read PDFs. It already can. It just does it a little bit uh, jankily right now. Well, let me ask you a few things. Um, will all of this, right now there are paid and unpaid versions. What's your vision? Since you also teach innovation, you teach entrepreneurship, are all these things going to stay free? If they are, what's their revenue model? Is it advertising? Like, how do you see this playing out from just a from our point of view and from the company's point of view? So, right now, OpenAI is uh, has announced that they're on a run rate of one point two billion dollars in revenue for after less than a year after releasing ChatGPT. Most of that money probably comes through their use of their API, which is their their um, business to business solution. Right, uh, less of it is the twenty dollars a month we pay. Right, and if you pay for GPT Plus, which by the way, if you can, you should. Um, there is almost uh, the difference between GPT four and GPT three point five. The paid version and the free version is so large as it may not appear that way at first, but it's big enough that it is one hundred percent worth it. Um, Microsoft releases a bunch of GPT four products through Bing, and they're planning on doing it free, as far as I know, for the near future. Google uh, Bard is also releasing theirs for free, both because it's part of the search engine fight going on. So we are the benefits, but it also means that people in one hundred sixty nine countries around the world have access to GPT-4 and will probably have Bard access as well, which means the same model that you get access to if you go to Goldman Sachs or you go to you know McKinsey or you go to Nike, it's no better than the model that every kid in Uganda and Sri Lanka has access to, which I think is really exciting and interesting, also really a big deal for education. Well, you've brought me five questions, but let me go one at a time because I'm getting excited here. Um, obviously, you spent time thinking about Wharton Interactive. So this idea of democratizing education through something like this has to be really thrilling and exciting to you as an educator and a scholar, because I know that was part of your mission and still is with Wharton Interactive. Yeah. So for those who don't know, Wharton Interactive is our attempt to build games and simulations to teach entrepreneurship at scale. And Wharton's been incredibly supportive. We have, uh, you've been incredibly supportive. We've had, we've have, uh, built these very large games. We have a team of people. We have writers and coders and, you know, interactive fiction experts. And, you know, once GPT-4 came out, we just tried the little experiment. We tried sort of saying, like, what if we just write a paragraph, create a simulation of a negotiation, give me grading on it, make it realistic, and 80% of the way there with a paragraph, 
Like GPT-4 just runs a simulation. So we have pivoted now. All of our simulations are basically AIs powering every. We have AIs watching AIs and AIs that are instructors and AIs that are mentors all interacting with each other that are actually doing teaching, right? So, so is it writing the code? Does it, it doesn't even need to write the code. Like it is writing the code, but that turns out to be secondary. It's writing the code, it's creating the images, it's doing all that stuff. But what it really is, is also the brains of the operation. If we do good prompting, we can tell it, here's your goal. Make sure that you're keeping students engaged. Change tone if you need to. Here's your overall, and it just does it all. I'm just in shock because, wow. So let me ask you a question. How does one become, I know this is part of your video series. How does one, I don't know if called an expert, but how does one become sophisticated, is a good word, in prompt engineering? Like, could I do this? Do I need subject matter expertise to create specific enough prompts? Or is it just by, as you and your wife talked about in the video series, you'll just learn by doing yeah, so it's a really good question, and uh, sort of all of the above. So a few things. One is, for those who don't know, prompt engineering, right, is the idea of writing really good prompts to AI. It is going to go away. Uh, there is not a. I talk to OpenAI regularly. Talk to Microsoft. Talk to Google. Nobody who's insiders thinks this is going to last because the AI is really good at intent. If you say I want to write a novel, fairly soon it'll just be able to say like, okay, here's let's go through the steps together. It already kind of does that, right? So it's you can get eighty percent of the way there by just interacting with the AI. Now. There is an exception. If you want to encode your expertise as a subject matter expert, you want this to do a really good you know, marketing analysis, it will do a perfectly fine job. But if you encode your expertise into it by saying, here's the angle you should take, here's the approach, do a little bit of prompt engineering, you could give that prompt to anyone and they'll get the benefits almost of your experience or wisdom. So there is some value in doing that. Uh, it's pretty straightforward. Most of it's using it. 10 hours of the Frontier model is my minimum rule of thumb. But then beyond that piece, there's a couple simple tricks. So one is you tell the AI who it is, you give it context. So the more context, the better. You are an expert marketer. And weirdly, by the way, there is a research now suggesting that when you tell the AI is an expert under some circumstances, it works better. Um, again, it's there's a lot okay. of strange stuff about prompting. The second thing you want to do is provide a lot of what's called few shot. You want to provide a lot of examples. So when you're sending that, you want to say, here's some examples of the kind of report that you'll produce. And the third thing you want to do is have it do step-by-step -step thinking. So you want to say, first do this, then do that, then do this, because it kind of only knows what it writes. So you want it to write stuff out and then go back to it and then build a plan from there. Those three things will make you a better prompt engineer, but it's not going to be that important in the long term. All right, so let's go back to the focus of AI and education. So let's talk about the roles that we have as educators. So you already said the traditional way of doing homework. Let's start with homework is in jeopardy. So given that, what can we do? Or in my view, I've already, I'm teaching next semester. I'm like, use chat GPT. As a matter of fact, if you know how to do this to solve the problems I'm asking you to do, that's a skill set. Or should I be thinking about this differently? And then I want to go to standing in the classroom. Then I want to go to other forms of assessment and things that we do yeah. Well, so the problem is what I feel is everybody's rushing to do a chat GPT class, right? And then the answer is like, yes, chat can do that. I mean, there are very few things that um, at a sort of medium level, the chat, like at the 80th percentile, that chat doesn't do reasonably well right now. So the question is, do we want all of our classes to be, can you use chat GPT to solve this problem? I think we still want to teach the subjects that are really good at teaching. We still think people need to learn these things, which means we have to adjust, right? Uh, you can't use, by the way, everybody should know, do not use any kind of um, AI detector. They do not work. They're biased against people whose English is second language. They all have fought whole five, you know, that, that ship has sailed. We cannot detect AI right Okay, so just to be clear, yeah. just like when we, we have Canvas at the University of Pennsylvania, there's a Turnitin, which is, so th whatever version of that for AI, you might as well just forget it. Now, it doesn't mean, but, well, this isn't, look, I think you can see where my next question is going. Let's say Eric Bradlow and Ethan Mollick are both in a class, and they both use ChatGPT4 to solve some problem. And let's say by chance, they happen to both put in the same prompt Will they get the same exact text back? And if the answer is no, if both of those were turned in, could Canvas's turn it in, not say it was AI generated, but would it say, hey, wait a second, there's cheating going on here because their responses are so similar? So really good question. A few things. First of all, they wouldn't get the same answer because there's randomness built into this a temperature, right? So there's a, ran there's a random seed initially, and then the words are a little bit randomly different, which diverges over time. So you're saying large language models are probably, I'm a statistician, are, are, they're probabilistic models, which means means 
even if we put in the exact same prompt, we're going to get out things because there's a probability of the next word or the next phrase. And they're autoregressive. So once they uh, head into one direction or another, they sort of spin off in that direction further. Very interesting. So that's the first thing, right? The okay. second the, so the the second thing is I have had an assignment even before ChatGPT came out using GPT three, where I had my students te- cheat in class. So I had them write the best essay they could. Part of the assignment is you have to prompt it at least five times. By the time you prompt the AI two or three or four times, there's no way that they seem similar anymore, right? If you give it so yes, if people just paste in the question, right, they're not going to be the same answer, but they might have some similarities. If they do any work like make this more vivid or here's my writing style, that's all they need to make it very different. Turnitin will not detect those things. And I, I, by the way, I really think it's unethical to use Turnitin right now. You should be turning it off, right? Like it is, it is, it it, it will falsely, it has a high false accusation rate. And also, by the way, even worse is to ask GPT-4 or chat GPT-3, the 3.5 free version, whether something was created by AI. Um, a new study showed GPT-4 has a 95% rate of just telling you that something's made by AI if you paste it in and ask if it's made by AI. And GPT-3.5 has like a 5% rate of telling you. They just randomly say this is made by AI or not. They have no way of telling. So what kind of things can be, you know, what when you presented to the Wharton faculty, which was one of the best, most informative presentations I've seen in a long time, when you presented to the Wharton faculty, I was like, okay, Maybe at the time this was true. Like, all right, so maybe it's not text data, but maybe I'll give exam questions that have video, or maybe I'll give stuff that has voice, because you know what? Chat GPT can't possibly do as well with that. Am I off base? Or, well, let me just say, I might be correct, but it's better than you think. No, it's uh, it's better at voice than humans are right now. So Whisper, which is the free... Uh, G- built into G- the ChatGPT app, uh, probably illegally trained, not illegally, I don't, I don't know who's watching, but trained on, uh, on YouTube videos, probably, as far as we can tell, has better than human hearing. So like accents, um, you know, mixes of languages. I use it all the time. When actually, my students pitch to it. Um, I have re- real venture capitalists and then I have the AI playing a VC. The VCs think that the AI does a better job than they do in giving feedback. Um, so yes, it can listen. Um, they, it now can see things. So any visual problem, you just upload and it will so address So if I upload a video or anything. So video, it still has a little bit of trouble with. So that you can ah. just pull off video right now. Um, but give it, uh, give it, a, give it a few days. No, I mean a couple months probably. Well, you actually brought up another topic. I mean, we'll. We've been talking about AI and education. Again, I'm joined by my friend and colleague, Ethan Mollick. He's the Ralph J. Roberts Distinguished Faculty Scholar, a professor in our management department, also the academic director of Wharton Interactive. And clearly, I think it's fair to say one of the leading scholars on artificial intelligence, both in education and the workforce. Um, Could you talk to us about the work that you've done on AI and the workforce? Because I know you're extremely proud of the work you're doing. And I just want to see, because a lot of our, you know, uh, experts have talked about it can't be AI or humans. It's got to be AI and humans. I'm just interested in the angle in which you've studied AI in the workforce. Yeah. Uh, so, okay. So um, one example, we have a, I have a paper with um, a whole bunch of great people at Harvard, including Kareem Lakhani, uh, Fabrizio Della Quella, um, and uh, people at MIT, Kate, uh, Kate Kellogg, a whole bunch of people on this project. But what we did was we went to BCG, right? One of the three big elite consulting companies. Um, and a lot of our Boston consulting group, a lot of our uh, students want of work there, a lot of alumni work there, and we did an experiment. We uh, created 20 tasks that were all realistic tasks with BCG, they're actual tasks they use, uh, and we gave some, of eight, we used 8% of their global workforce, which was a lot. And oh, So when you say an experiment, you mean an actual experiment? I mean an actual experiment, 8% of their global workforce, and some of them got the help of GPT-4, and some did not, and there were a bunch of other conditions. The people who were given GPT-4 to use in business tasks had a 40% improvement in quality. No training, no specialization in the module, just the same chat GPT all of us have access to. 40% increase in quality across 108 regressions. How uh, was quality measured? Every way we could. So we did okay. analytical tasks and marketing tasks and persuasion tasks. And all of them were graded by human PhDs, That's human MBAs. And then we also used GPT-4, which, by the way, grades just as well as humans do. It's just a little nicer on the scores. But the relative scores were exactly the same. And then they completed tasks uh, 26% faster, got 12 point, or sorry, 26% more tasks done, 12.5% faster. No training, nothing. Training, in, like we only had like five minutes of training for some conditions, others for none. Just to put that in context, when steam power was put into a factory in the early 1800s, it improved performance by 18 to 22 percent. We've never seen a 40 percent improvement. This is not tuned. This is not trained. This is the chat interface that you're used to using. Um, so huge, huge performance impacts on, on from just a little experiment. All right. So usually in academic papers, we have some thesis or hypothesis. Then in your case, you have an experiment and results. 
What did the back end of that paper look like? So let's imagine you're now consulting for a company, BCG, or you're consulting to our students, undergrads, MBAs, like this should be how you think about your training. What did the back end of the paper, like what conclusions did you come to as a result of this? Well, we barely, there's so much else we could talk about here too that are, you know, interesting caveats on creativity and who, who uses what answers, but let, let's, and, and also how people work with AI, right? That's another thing I've been doing a lot of work on. Uh, oh, effectively. But um, I mean, the back end of the paper is really the idea that like, look, this is a big enough impact that this should be a red alert everywhere in every organization, right? You don't see these kind of performance improvements. A lot of people are taking their time on AI. They're assisting that they do something like, you know, integrate their own data with the AI system. We didn't have to do that here. Like the AI, the P in GPT stands for pre-trained. It knows a lot of stuff already. It's not clear that you should be waiting to build a large data integration and use RAG and all these other techniques when you should just probably be using this and it should be a red alert to figure out how to use this because, you know, as much as we say, oh, it's people using AI, but also, I mean, another side of this paper was there's appendix C to the paper that I don't always talk about because it's, I don't quite know what to do with it, but it measures uh, what's called retainment. How much of GPT-4's answer did you just use as your answer? And there's almost a direct correlation between how much of the answer you use and how successful your results are. I mean, there's a direct correlation. It's almost right. perfect correlation. So basically, the only way to mess up was to change ChatGPT's answer. Hmm. And not only that, the performance boost was at the largest for everyone in the bottom half of performance. So we measured prior and after performance, 42% boost in improvement from the bottom half, 18% for the top half performance. It leveled everybody up to like the eighth percentile of BCG consultants. Like, I don't even know what to do with that. That's such a big number. So given, as you said, this is more impactful than the steam engine, what, what did BCG now do with this? Like, what's their plan? I mean, is there any, let me just say, do they have any doubt that what you found is generalizable? Like maybe, here's an argument. I'll be a statistician for a moment. Maybe this wasn't, oh, you said 8% of the workforce. Maybe this wasn't a massive sample size. Maybe it works for these 20 tasks, but not for these tasks. Or maybe there's some sort of, you know, maybe it helps in the short run. But you know what? We can also train humans. So maybe the effectiveness is going to decrease over time. I'm just playing, a like if I were a reviewer on a paper, I'm just playing the devil's advocate. What would be the response to all of this? So a few things. There, it, we did manage to create one task the AI couldn't do. Oh. And right, we, so one of the things to know oh, about our AI, listeners here how, want to hear what yeah. that is. So, well, it was hard, right? Oh. It was a task where we had to hide data in interviews and some was in spreadsheets. And this was before ADA, the advanced data analysis module came out. But we managed to find something, right? Um, and it took some work. And then on that task, you, what happened was people who used AI did worse because they were mistaken because they took in what the AI was doing. So, there, so part of what people are saying is like, well, what's the border of what AI does and doesn't? We call that the jagged frontier. Like, for example, if you ask GPT-4 to write a 25-word paragraph, it'll have trouble doing that because it doesn't see words, it sees tokens. But if you ask it to write a sonnet, it'll do an amazing job of that. Sonnets are harder for humans than 25 words. You have to learn the frontiers of AI. Going back to the point we mentioned earlier, if you use it a lot, that's how you start to understand it's going to be good at this task, bad at another task. So to go back to the overall kind of question, right, about what do you do with this, right, is it generalizable? This is just one piece of result. There's another study at MIT that got published in Science that shows similar size improvements in business writing tasks in a completely different sample. There's a study um, out of GitHub showing the same kind of improvement for programmers. Like the 30 to 70 percent number just keeps coming up over and over again in different samples. In different there's a piece on creative work. There's another paper uh, out of Harvard looking at um, at you know business implications. Uh, sorry, business um, proposal writing. There's our own colleague uh, Christian Turwich, uh, Carl Ulrich, and the, and their colleagues work showing innovation. So this is not like a one-time thing. You know, this is a pretty broad-based set of findings. So where do you think the, I, I like the word, jagged edge? Yeah, where jagged is, frontier. Jagged frontier. Yeah. Where is the jagged frontier here? I mean, do you even, I mean, you probably know more than, let's say you're in the one one-thousandth upper percentile of people in knowledge about GPT right, or, or AI in general right now. Where do you think that jagged frontier is? So it's hard to explain, right? Which is part of why this is a, as much- and doesn't it always move that, well, outwards? Well, that is, that's the main thing is the frontier is moving out. Like I guarantee in the next month, the frontier is going to move out, right? Like some for some reasons I know, I can't talk about it, some reasons that are already public elsewhere, but like this is not stopping. There's no indication to me that the jagged frontier is not gonna keep moving forward in the next few months, right? Next year or two. And I think ultimately the big question is how far, how fast, and when does it stop? And I will tell you, the people training the AI models, I don't think have an answer to that question. So let's start with a few things. Um, 
how much I, I saw, I think it was yesterday, President Biden signed, signed an, a bill or something, an executive order on artificial intelligence and some sort of safety, security protection. Could you tell our listeners, what is that about? Like, what is, what is the policy trying to do? So there, there's a few things in the policy, right? What I, 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 have, I have not spent a huge amount of time in the executive order, but what it does that I like about is there's, there's sort of two stages of threats from AI that people are worried about. One is, that you may hear, if you read the press a lot, you may hear about extinction risk, right? What if we make AGI, artificial intelligence, smarter than a human? And what does it do to us? Does it save us? Does it kill us? What happens if we build a machine god? And by the way, that's like the stated goal of open AI is to build uh, AGI, right? That's their plan. By the way, uh, just so I know, I just want to be sure, since I'm a big movie guy, I don't know how much you watch movies. Like, wasn't that some part of Terminator? Like, in other words, these robots became so smart that in some sense they ended up launching wars and everything. I mean, the Schwarzenegger movie, yeah, Terminator? Yeah, term- ter- that is it's wh- not unrelated, right? No, it, that, that is one example of AGI, right? Okay. Um, the, the people who are in favor of AGI think that this will save us all and, you know, and redeem humanity and give us all eternal life. The people who uh, don't like it think it'll murder us all. So I think it's worth worrying about. Like, it's something that enough serious people in computer science are worried about that we should, I'm glad that we're addressing that. But I think the bigger policy implications in the near term for me as somebody at the Wharton School is, look, we've got something that's doing high-end creative work, high-end managerial work. It's going to get better at this. Like, we're improvising a chat interface and using that to do consulting work. Like, that's pretty crazy. So that means there's going to be widespread implications for work, widespread implications for education, as we were talking about. And also, one of the things that really is important, like, the part of the reason we catch criminals and, like, bad actors so easily, especially when they're not connected to, like, a state intelligence agency, is most of them aren't that great, right? Now, what happens if the AI makes brings everybody up to 8th percent percentile in biological engineering, 80th percentile in building chemical weapons. That's also a concern. And then there's privacy concerns. Deep fakes are perfect from this thing, right? Like, so can so, you define what a deep fake is? Like, what what does that term mean? Sure. I mean, AI um, content is basically undetectable. I have made videos of my fake me talking. I, I my presentations, I always have one real picture. Everything else I generate on my own. No one can tell what the real picture is, right? So you cannot tell if I can create an actor with their voice. I can do this right now for a dollar fifty with software that anyone can use. It's not even like dark web software. It's a company that's VC backed, uh, and I can use eleven labs and DID and create a fake video of you talking right now. And, you know, it'd be pretty realistic. So we have this issue with this kind of deep fake email. It's also a perfect phishing engine. Like you shouldn't trust anything you see online anymore. And that's not a joke. Like there literally is no way to know. Like I, I've already talked to banks who've gotten calls uh, in from the voice of people who weren't actually calling them demanding money from ransoms. Like stuff is going crazy already. That is, ship has already sailed. So part of the Biden agenda is like, how do we watermark these things? Not going to be possible. Like it's just, that's, that's not going to happen, really, because even though these frontier models are based in the U.S., there's a whole bunch of open source models, worldwide models, that are not going to have this kind of protection. So the the, the attempt of this uh, executive order, for the way I see it, is both to do worrying about this sort of future AI and training it, but also trying to think about how do we restore privacy? How do we restore, you know, and I don't know how much of that's possible, but regulation is probably needed. So a lot of our listeners are probably sitting here saying, I need to get started. Like, I, I, I haven't even started, but now, clearly, if I'm listening to Professor Malik, I've got to start now. Where do you suggest that someone starts? Like, you mentioned 10 hours. Let's say that's good. What what should they spend their 10 hours doing? Like, where should they go? You know, we're at Wharton, so we're fortunate. We have the video series you sent around. But, I mean, whether it's you have materials, others have materials. Can you go? I'm making it up. Can you go to Khan Academy? I mean, I don't know. Where do, where does someone go to get started? So, a few things. Uh, those videos are on YouTube. Anyone can see them. Oh, so your you search, videos are on If YouTube. you search the name of Ethan Malik, you'll find it. I ah. also have a sub stack with a whole bunch of getting started guides called One Useful Thing, all which free. I just, which I just started uh, following uh, today. Uh, excellent. Sure. Hopefully, you'll enjoy that. But, I mean, I think the basic of this are my, my principles of AI, my first principle of using AI is just invite it to everything you morally and legally can. Use it for everything. Use it for your job. Like literally, you want to send an email, see how good the AI is writing the email. You have to do ideation, you know, have it do ideation. You're going to a meeting, bring it to the meeting, have it record the meeting and give you advice and feedback on what you should do better next time. Just use it for everything. That's the only way to figure out what the jagged frontier is in your field. There, nobody knows anything right now, right? Like, as I said, I talk to all of the major AI companies on a regular basis, and like, no one has an instruction manual for this thing. No one knows whether it's going to be good or bad in your subfield, whoever you're listening at right now. So you can be the world expert by just using it and seeing what that is. So just try it for your work, and then there's a bunch of techniques you'll start to learn. But the first thing is to try it. It's really important, though, to use a frontier model to use the most advanced model available to you right now. Now, you mentioned something else about you think that, I think, let me see if I got this right, that I think it was Google 
you I think you used the term like they're coming out with something new that might be better than chat GPT. What would better mean in like when you use the word better? I was just intrigued by that. What does it mean to be better than one, you know, uh, large language model, et cetera, being better than another? OK, so there's a lot of interesting angles to that right now. All the major frontier, the two major frontier models, which are OpenAI's model, which is sort of Microsoft powers it as well, and Google's model, both are, have added a whole bunch of capabilities that if you're not paying attention, you may have missed. So they're all fully multimodal. You can ask them to create pictures. They they also can see the world, right? So like not doing an image search, but like you literally could show a picture and say, how does this dress fit? And it will give you reasonable feedback on that. Or how do you know what? How do I undo this lock? Or what's this passcode? Whatever you want to do. Um, so they're all multimodal. They all are going to be doing voice back and forth. They all connect to other, they can read documents, connect to other materials. So that's kind of the basics. All of that is connected to the large language model itself, which you can kind of think of as the brain. And so large language models basically get smarter over time. So if we think about uh, GPT 3.5, the free version you're using, maybe a high school sophomore. I would say GPT 4 at its best moments is, is a first year grad student. So part That's of the question, yeah. So part of the question is, what is two or four times better than that look like? We don't know yet. So we could just do raw test scores, right? We go from scoring at the, you know, at the uh, fifth percent of the bar exam, beating five percent of humans for free chat GPT, to beating ninety five percent of humans for GPT four. What happens with the next one? We we don't really know. But so smarts is sort of the smarts of the brains behind the whole thing. So this is the question I've asked everyone in this series uh, to kind of end the episode. If we're sitting here 10 years from now, and we'll make a date, I'm going to interview this, I hope, interview the same group of people 10 years from now. What are we talking about, do you think, that has happened over the previous 10 years? I can only think it's scenarios at this point, right? I mean, because the the only question that kind of matters for this is how fast will these models improve and when will they hit their limits, right? And nobody knows the answer to those questions, right? So it's not going to be static. If you think you have time to wait, you don't because these models are advancing very rapidly. The question is, do they stop at the 95th percentile of the best humans in one area? Like, so everybody's got something they're really good at that they definitely beat the AI in. 99th percentile? Better than human? We don't know, right? And so to me, that's the only relevant question, right? And so nobody has the answer to that. So we have to prepare for a scenario where, okay, we're getting close to the top. I don't, I haven't seen evidence of this, but it's entirely possible that it starts to slow down. But then we still have at least 10 or 15 years of absorbing what GBD4 can do because it's barely connected to anything in the world, right? We've got 10 years of disruption ahead of us that's going to roll ahead anyway. If they keep getting better, then we start to think seriously about if not AGI, what does it mean that it beats every human at, you know, writing marketing copy? Like, what do we do with that, right? Do we, you know? And so there's a lot of open questions. So I don't have the easy answers, but I think that there is, I think we're, you're more likely to see a transform world in 10 years than in five, even if the technology stops, because it takes a while for systems to absorb change, right? The, the, the futurist rule is that everyone overestimates short-term change and underestimates long-term change. I think 10 years, we're going to see a transform world in a lot of ways that are, some are good, some are bad. Well, I'd like to thank uh, Professor Ethan Malik for joining me today on the podcast series on AI and education and the workforce. Uh, Ethan's an associate professor of management. He's also an academic director of Wharton Interactive. And as he said, you can go to your favorite engine and type in Ethan Malik, and you can see about his Substack and about his videos on YouTube. Ethan, thank you for joining me. Thank you for having me.